Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside Jacob and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How Awesome is this place. There is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. The word of the Lord. When Jacob awoke with the sky up above and his head on a stone, he said, Surely the Holy One is here in this place, and I just didn't know it till now. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven, the gate of heaven, the gate of heaven. When Jacob awoke with the sky up above and his head on a stone, he said, I just didn't know it till now. This is none other than the house of God. This is a gate. 
When I was a child, I was taught a lot of things about God. I was taught that God was sort of like the divine Santa Claus, that God gave us good gifts, that we could kind of rely on God to make everything better. I was taught that God rewards good children and that the way that we should live is by seeking God's rewards. And when I was a teenager, I remember memorizing this verse from Psalm that said, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Sort of a transactional understanding of God that as long as I did what God wanted, I would get my dreams come true. I remember thinking and reciting the text from Romans that says, God works all things together for good for those who love him. So this was kind of the, the way I understood God, was that God was sort of a little bit more complex than the good fairy, but pretty close. That God was going to do all these nice things for us and that whatever we did, as long as we did it with a good intention, God would make it come true. Well, guess what? That is not the way God really is. And in fact, as life unfolds, if we are taught those kinds of uh, really two-dimensional understandings of God, we're going to have a crisis. I certainly had a crisis of faith in my life when that kind of Santa God idea didn't work out. God is so much more complex, and in the particularity of Jesus, we see that complexity, which is sort of ironic. We heard this morning, uh, we heard this scripture from Genesis, and the experience that Jacob has is of a dream. He's moving out of his adolescence. He's been thinking that he's doing all these things that categorically, with the cooperation of his mother, are going to make him the successful brother. He's the younger twin, and he's a trickster, and he tricks his brother into getting the blessing instead of his brother, who's like 10 minutes older, and it doesn't work out the way he thought. He thought God would immediately make it all good. I can only imagine that thinking this way and, and moving towards uh, facilitating God's will was exactly what he had in mind as he was tricking his brother to become the heir of his father Isaac. But indeed, at the moment that we find this story, he has been kicked out of his family and he is running for his life. His brother, 20 minutes older, is super mad at him and he's pretty certain that if his brother finds him, that Jacob will be killed. And so here he is off in the wilderness, a northern part of Palestine, and he's sleeping on a hilltop because he doesn't want to be surprised. So he wants to be able to look out there and see all around him and make sure if his brother's coming and sneaking up on him. But at some point in the night, he falls asleep and he has a dream. And his dream isn't a, it's about God, and it's about God's purposes for him, but it's not the dream that he probably was expecting. It wasn't the dream about you're going to have this all work out and you'll be restored in your relationship with Esau. Instead, it's, a, it's God's dream. It's God's dream for the world, and it's, it's about things that Jacob will never even live to see. He only knows that they will happen. God says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. He says this in Isaiah 58. God's purposes for us are different than our purposes for ourselves. But you know, a lot of us are sort of like still stuck in this mode that what we do and what we want is what God wants for us. That our will is God's will. And that all we have to do is keep functioning out of what we want and God will make it happen in cooperation with us. I think of it sort of like that uh, Christmas story, you know, the movie, and there's little Ralphie and he wants the BB gun. And he wants that BB gun so badly and he keeps telling his parents and he's got the whole name of that thing. I don't remember it, but it's like a litany that he says every time. He dreams about all the things he's going to do with that BB gun, but every time he tells his parents he wants it, they say, you'll shoot your eye out. Over and over again throughout the movie, that's the sort of repetition. Him dreaming about all the power and things when he achieves his dream, and his parents naming a reality. 
Well, if you've seen the movie, you know what happens. Ralphie opens his Christmas present, and indeed, it's exactly what he was hoping for, the exact brand, it's the BB gun. But what does he do? He goes out in the yard, and the first time he shoots it, he not, the thing has a kickback, it goes right into his eye, his glasses break, he's bleeding, he goes running into his parents. The crisis has come. The dream that he worked for for so hard, for so long, has kicked him in the eye and he's left bleeding. For so many of us, that's the point at which God meets us. When we realize that our dreams are not God's dreams. So, I think about this when I think about Jacob. And there he was asleep with his head on a rock. If you've ever tried to sleep with your head on a rock, pretty miserable. He's at the bottom of the barrel. He's at the very point at which that dream that he had been functioning out of, thinking that God would cooperate, has come to an end. And instead, he's given a new dream. He's given a dream that blows his mind. He doesn't even have the capacity to imagine how that dream is going to come about. Imagine if somebody told you you were going to have more kids than the dust of the earth or the sand on the seashore. Well, as a woman, I'll tell you that is not a happy promise. I wouldn't want to be pregnant that many times. But the whole thing is impossible. It's only possible because it's God's dream and not ours. This is a God who came to us as a baby. This is a God who had a dream for the world and continues to fulfill that dream in ways that completely subvert our expectations. Not just a baby, but a poor baby. A baby laying in a barn is God come to us. God's dreams are not our dreams. And our invitation is to trust that when we're in the middle of the wilderness and we think all has hit rock bottom, that it's the beginning not the end. That this is the place that is none other than the house of God. That this is the steps of heaven. It might feel like that for you right now. It feels like our whole world is tanking in so many ways. And yet, this is the place where God's dream might become more and more apparent to us, both for our own lives and for our community. The promise for us, my friends, is that the God that comes like a little seed, the God that comes to us in small ways, is capable of taking us when we have been reduced to nothing and bringing us back to life. A God who promises us that no, you're not going to have perfection and happiness, but you're going to have purpose and hope because you're cooperating with God's dream for you. Maybe your wishes won't come true, but indeed it is possible and certain that your wandering will bring you home. Maybe in this life you won't see the success that you've worked for for so hard, but you will see salvation. And salvation isn't simply being saved from, but being flourishing within, taken from a place of dying and brought into a place of fullness and life. That's the hope we have, in spite of what it looks like around us, whether we're on that hillside of Bethel, that hill, waking up in the middle of the wilderness like Jacob did, or whether we're waking up today feeling pretty hopeful, God's dream is still available to us. When Jacob made that altar using the pillow of a rock, he named that place Bethel, the house of God. And that place for generations has continued to be a place that was considered a holy site. In fact, after the exile, the people that were left, the remnant of Samaria, what became the Samaritans, continued to worship on that hill. It was a place of holiness, a place of walking up to it and saying, yes, it looks like a wilderness, but I know God is here. Maybe in your life you need to find a Bethel. Maybe you're sitting in that room you've been in since quarantine and that's your Bethel place. Remember it. Remember that God is going to take you from this place and move you into the future in ways that you and I can't even imagine now. And may we not forget. 
May we not fall back into thinking of God as the divine Santa, God as the provider as long as we complete our end of the transaction. There's so much more, friends. There's a Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, holy, amazing world and life ahead of us that we can't even begin to comprehend. But we know that God dwells there. And God doesn't want us to miss out. Let us pray. Eternal God, you gave to your incarnate Son the holy name of Jesus to be the sign for our salvation. Plant in every heart, we pray, the love of him who is the Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The blessing of God, the God who has a dream that can blow our minds and will when we walk in it. May the blessing of that God be upon you this day and forever. Amen.